Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. We'll be discussing the COVID Moonshot Collaboration and engaging in a philosophical conversation with Drs. Annette Von Delft and Ed Griffin, which will be moderated by Mona Lisa Chatterjee. There we go. Ed is the technical director at MedChemical Limited and leads the design team in the COVID Moonshot. His interests are in medicinal chemistry and particularly in anti-infective and the development of new approaches focused on explainable AI methods to improve and accelerate lead generation and optimization. Annette joined the University of Oxford in 2018 as a translational scientist with a focus on inflammation and immunity. She is currently driving the Moon COVID Moonshot Open Science Drug Discovery Project in collaboration with multiple international partners. Mona Lisa has 20 plus years of experience in both small molecules and biologics discovery and development. She is the innovator for TBA 7371 and T1H at AstraZeneca and BioCon respectively. For the past three years, Dr. Chatterjee served as senior program officer at the Gates Foundation where she supported collaborative COVID research with World Health Organization, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, and CARE. Mona Lisa was involved in the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator and was recognized among 75 women by the government of India in 2022 for excellence in the field of STEAM. Now, before I turn this over to Mona Lisa, I want to remind the attendees that you can put your questions for our panelists in the Zoom Q&A panel. So look for the icon that I'm showing here on the screen. And we will reserve time uh, at the end of the webinar to discuss your questions. All right, Mona Lisa, I think I will turn this all over to you. Thank you, Charlie. And it's a pleasure to be here. A very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining this webinar today. Thanks to CDD team for organizing it and welcome Ed and Annette. I think I have the most uh, privilege and I'm enjoying this opportunity to have this conversation about COVID Moonshot. For me, it's a unique program. It is uh, drug discovery, open discovery happening in real time and under really unprecedented circumstances. So if we look back, uh, <laughs> in the years 2020, 2021. What it really felt like is we were building a plane, airplane, and we were trying to fly it simultaneously. At least that's the feeling, that's how we used to describe at the foundation. Everybody was trying to look at um, these antivirals, active agents, uh, but there were no you know, preset selection criteria. There were no screening cascades. Assays were all coming up to, you know, in vitro, in vivo assays were all coming up. We didn't know the relevance. Biology was getting unraveled. Epidemiology was getting unraveled. And I think there was an explosion of information and data, all to different degrees of maturity. It got further, I think, complicated by the desire to have accelerated development. And honestly, there was a real pressure. Uh, as I now think back, it was a real pressure. There were people who were dying all around us. And I think every product developer in, uh, in the world, sometime or the other, have felt that the weight of the world is really on our shoulders. Uh, many of the initiatives took a near-term approach of identifying uh, repurposed candidates to address the acute need. As we will learn, um, COVID Moonshot uh, aimed at identifying novel drug candidates for SARS-CoV-2. So before we initiate our conversation, I would request Annette and Ed to give us an overview of the program. How did it all, in, how did it all begin? For me, more, most interestingly is how was the target selected? Because we know the main protease uh, is the target that was approached. Today, we are in a very different position. We have Pfizer's molecule approved Paxlovid. 
We have uh, candidates from Shionogi, we are from Pardes. We have a substantial clinical validation for the target. But when the program began, it must have been extremely difficult considering that there were fragment screen completed for other targets. So we would love to learn how did you select this target and why. So over to you, Ed and Ed for giving us an overview. <laughs> Shall I, shall I start on this one, Annette? So uh, I joined the project about, in all reality, about 10 days in, which at the time felt like uh, you know, a huge amount of time given how fast people were working. But the, the slightly, um, in some ways, depressing view is actually it was just the most pragmatically accessible target. So a protea, you know, if, if you look at protea, the history of re recent history of antivirals, proteases have got good precedence in HIV, HCV. So that's the positive. You have a general belief that a protease for an antiviral is probably doable. Critically, the assay was doable. And, and that the, the very fact you can get on and do the work led us immediately to being able to work. So it, it was a mixture of it looks roughly like we ought to be able to do this and technically we can do it so that was the that was the genuine selection but with all the risks that the the uh, uh, main protease in coronaviruses it's a cysteine protease that's not a good target yeah. so it, it was driven off technical accessibility and a fragment screen had been done is there anything you want to pick up on that or that yeah, the, um, the diamond light source actually performed the fragment screen very rapidly. And the reason that they were able to do that was because um, the Chinese group that had originally performed the SARS-1 screen um, contacted them very early on in the pandemic and said, look, we've got the construct for SARS-CoV-2. We've got the crystal structure. It's not released yet, but we know you're running the fragment screens. Do you want us to ship it over? to the diamond light source. And at that point, they had already, like the team at Diamond had already started looking at a lot of other um, potential targets, but they didn't have the constructs available. They're starting to order stuff in. And they actually said to the Chinese team, yes, that would help a lot. Can you send the constructs over? And just then they got hit by the lockdown. Um, so the constructs actually didn't ship out of China. Um, to, to Diamond, and they had to wait for the ordered constructs, but it did help a lot that they already knew what was the crystallizable form. So they ordered exactly the same construct, and as soon as it arrived, they performed the fragment screen. So Empro was actually, even though they ran fragment screens on all the other targets that are shown here, um, was the first one that was ready, that had crystals reproducible and ready for fragment screen. So this was the first data set that was available. And so I think it was both the theoretic accessibility of the target, the previous data that was available for, for SARS-1 that made it more approachable, but also the pure fact that it was the target that could be processed very, very quickly. And of course, then they also ended up with quite a lot of fragment hits in the active site. So it could have turned out completely different where yeah. you get the crystals, you run the fragment screen and actually you only get three hits and haven't got much to go on. But what the team at Diamond didn't know is basically what to do with all these hits. So because getting a lot of fragment hits is, is a very, very long and long way off having a compound that you can do something with. And that's where Ed and a lot of other colleagues from the COVID moonshot came into the picture. And Ed, I, I wasn't involved at that point, so maybe you can kind of um, continue the story there. Yeah, so, so <clears throat> having uh, probably actually, if we, if we go on to the next slide, there, there's a great kind of genesis moment um, between four of the real founders of the, the moonshot. So there we are. We've got the, the <clears throat> as, as Annette has said, an excellent set of fragments. And the question is, how are we going to join them up, which is a non-trivial task. It always looks, um, much of the moonshot looks very straightforward when you look backwards, but was an absolute kind of firefight going forwards. 
and so the question was we've got the fragments how are we going to join them up fragment joining or fragment extendings yeah. can be hard and the four people who really started off the moonshot so near john alpha and frank we got the data um john had the idea of can we rank ideas near had the idea of can we get people to submit ideas to join these fragments and extend them and Alpha was saying, well, we could put together a website and get people to contribute. So we'd have crowdsource all the different ways of improving these fragments because a fragment, a fragment is just that. It's not even potent enough, potent enough to show up on any kind of assay. So you've got to get on the board to start with. And that, that effort to, to join the molecules, get them together, was where the moonshot started. And it started um essentially with a selection of tweets which is a, a crazy way to start a drug discovery project um but in one long weekend uh the website was put up and chemists came flocking and ideas were submitted uh with a co collaboration with uh the folks at enamine in the ukraine um compounds were rapidly sourced and started to be shipped and a lot of chemists contributed, yeah, you know, as many of us were in lockdown, rolled up to suggest more compounds to rank them from universities, private individuals, consultants, people rolling up from large pharma and small and biotechs, pro bono donating their intellectual effort. Um, it was kind of, a, and we were meeting every night to, to push things forward. So, so if, 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 if I may just probe it a little bit, I understand hit finding. So this is a large scale, I don't know, distributed, open crowdsourcing of ideas. I, I can visualize it till hits, hit finding. You're actually talking about lead optimization and all the way to candidate stage. So how did it work? Different groups took up different leads, started optimizing it or gave ideas around it in real life. How did it work? Uh, so I think... Should we go on to the next slide? Because that gives some more. It, it started off, let, let's give you the real life view. It started off chaotic, okay? Because that's, that's how it is. Everybody's trying to contribute all their stuff. But very rapidly, we organized ourselves because we had a lot of very experienced people involved from the start. So what we were able to do was pull together. So they, on this slide, there's a picture of all the different groups we managed to get together globally um and decide where to make the compounds because fundamentally the whole process of going from fragment to lead to optimize lead is making and testing compounds and in our case getting a lot yeah. of crystal structures as well so we we established a process for being able to take the ideas in we established a very experienced group of medicinal and computational chemists to rank them using all sorts of tools, but fundamentally a, a peer review group to rank those ideas, to get them sent off to be made in predominantly one place. So the vast majority of compounds were actually synthesized all at enamine. And then we had our primary testing location was initially the Weizmann in Israel. And that's where the biochemical screening was done because they had a really good HTS, they have a really good screening group. Uh, they were able to do that. And then the antiviral testing was done at a huge range of labs because then we were chasing. I, and some of the time we ended up chasing lockdowns. So as one group would be in lockdown, we'd move who was doing the testing to another group. And we've had great contribution from to do particularly admet testing. We've had a really good contribution from Novartis contributing in kind. Um, and I'm not even sure I can read the names of all the groups who've contributed there. Um, it's it's vast. I, what, what do you want to add? To it? I mean, Annette, you've been responsible for coordinating an awful lot of the antiviral work. Would you want to add into to what I've just intimated? I think, yeah, taking a step back to 2020 and kind of um, just realizing at what point we were, we were at the point where um, a lot of the vaccines were very rapidly developed and um, a lot of the testing capacity um, in the labs was taken up um, worldwide. It was, it was very, very difficult um, to um, find, um, 
actually, it, it was very, very, um, a, a very hardcore time for all our antiviral collaborators to get all the work that they were suddenly kind of bombarded with, coordinated. And, and yeah. we were actually stunned by the response of different groups to help us out, even though at that point, um, the small molecule world was moving so much slower than the vaccine world. Let's put it that way. But um, we, we um, were extremely lucky to have a huge group of antiviral contrib contributors all the way through that um, were interested in working with us and um, um, freed up resources to run antiviral assays. That also, because we it was a very patchwork setup, it also meant that um, the cellular antiviral assays were coming in with a much slower pace than the enzyme assays because they are much more complicated to run, much more time intensive, and actually take up quite a huge, uh, quite a lot of resource on the lab setting side, um, because there are only very few labs that can run high throughput assays in a BSL-3 setting. Um, over time, um, we were lucky to work both with the Scripps lab through a Takeda collaboration and with um, a lab in Leuven in the Netherlands that actually screened quite a lot of our compounds at high throughput. But what we actually started off with and without what we couldn't have done was quite low throughput screening from a lot of other groups that initially tested our compounds. So a group in the Netherlands at Radboud University, then um, a group here at Oxford, a group at the Weizmann, who all screened maybe 10 compounds, maybe 20 compounds, maybe 50 compounds. Um, but it gave us an inkling of what would have cellular activity and what we could sort out. So um, they actually helped a huge amount in the kind of first phases until we got to the kind of higher throughput screening. But it also meant that, especially the cellular antiviral part, um, took a whole long, a whole lot longer to get going than the kind of initial make test design cycle that was relying on the enzyme assays. Yeah, and I, I, I can um, have a huge respect for all the antiviral testing group because we were expecting so much out of them. You have to validate your assays, you have to scale up, scale them up. You also have to optimize what MOIs, what, you know, what cell densities, we wanted everything optimized, yet keep reading out the high throughput screens and giving us the data. So uh, it, it was uh, really uh, amazing times to have all the assays up and ready, then running the high throughput screens. Uh, and and the, other, the other thing you, we don't have to forget is at that point, the main focus was on repurposing. And yes. um, so all these groups, at the same time as looking at vaccine Absolutely. responses, were running massive repurposing screens. Absolutely. In addition to kind of screening through some of the novel compounds that came through. So a massive effort and yeah, hats off to all the antiviral groups that have been working with us. And the other thing, just to build, is it's very easy, again, it's the whole problem of hindsight. You look back now and you think main protease inhibitors, yeah, that, those will work as antivirals. We didn't know, you know, at the very start, there was a reasonable risk that maybe the cellular drop-off would have been so high that you know you can you can inhibit the enzyme all you like and it's not actually an antiviral and that and and that's why it was so important to get that early stage and multiple antiviral assays because we didn't have the luxury of running a project for six months and building up a nice correlation between enzyme and cell and doing that and saying, oh yes, yes, it's definitely, it's all working because you start off with rubbish compounds basically. So you, we were having to do it with the very best compounds we could get and then run them through multiple antiviral assays in different places. So actually these early compounds, they are consistently showing a hint of antiviral activity, so it's worth this count. But we had some, I mean, there were subsets of compounds we walked away from that were good, good-ish, and enzyme inhibitors didn't see any cellular activity out of them, so mm -hmm. we just dumped them because it was, it, it wasn't a intellectual exercise of can we do this in theory, this was an exercise of how fast can you get an orally available antiviral if you throw everything you've got at it? 
So it's not, uh, as a medicinal chemist, I wouldn't say we did our most elegant work here, but we worked as quickly as we could. I think the, the other so thing, this... sorry, Monomisa. Now, the other thing that we have to consider is um, we were really working on a shoestring here. Um, like we, we didn't have any budget um, that that we could throw at things. We, we, we threw a lot of human resource and a lot of um, um, in kind contributions and, and, and a lot of effort at the project. Um, but the one thing that um, the COVID moonshot didn't have right at the start was money. Um, we, we had a little bit here, a little bit there. Everyone brought a, a bit of budget along. And for example, without enamine, this, um, who synthesized the compound, saying, we'll do this for you at cost, we wouldn't have been able to move. So um, we kind of resorted to um, a lot of indirect readouts. And um, for example, ADME and PK testing came very, very late in the project. As, at the point where we were able to get that as an account contribution or secured some funds to do it. So what when we say we threw everything we had at it, it we, we just need to keep in mind that this was a crowdsourced project and basically funded on in-kind contributions and not a lot of funding. So and, you can and, see and, the lot of goodwill that it actually, you know, fueled the program, uh, right? And it's pretty apparent from your collaborator across the globe that have contributed. I'd like to pick something on Ed mentioned just now. It, it, it was in those days it was really ambiguous which target to pick, which would actually um, make a meaningful efficacy readout, right? Uh, being and being selective and safe. And uh, there was no time to build target validation, no time to do all the classical uh, discovery process. So the two target classes came up, RDRPs came up, which has its own challenges. We all know about them. And the main protease came up and they were parallel programs which ran, I would say somewhat in similar time frame, not exactly, but right. So a question to you guys is, uh, how do you think uh, these programs influenced each other? Moonshot influenced other programs. Uh, and how did you learn from, were there any learnings from the programs that were running in parallel? Well, we, it's an excellent question. So I think we were simultaneously trying to keep aware of all of what was being published. We put all of our data out into the open immediately. Absolutely. So the, probably the, the most of the unusual things about the moonshot, one of the most unusual, was we disclosed structures at the point of conception into the public domain because it was an open science project from the get-go. So even, even before molecules had measured activity, even before they were synthesized, they were in the public domain. As soon as we generated biochemical data, that was put into the public domain, typically within 24 hours because we had an automated process publishing it. And we know that some of that data was picked up I can cite directly, so Shinogi used some of our data in setting up their pharmacophore search model that has led to them finding the series that in the end they were able to develop. So we were looking out at what was already in the public domain, what people were bringing through as peptidomimetics. You can see here on the, on the, the slide that's currently um, up, so, we deliberately went for non-peptidomimetics because we saw that other people were working in that space and we wanted to mm. work. We, at the start, we were equivocal about whether we would go with covalent inhibitors or non-covalent. And we had people on the team who would got covalent enzyme inhibitors into the clinic. And their view was, first of all, get the selectivity, then make it covalent. The actual arc of the project meant that by the time we'd got the selectivity, we'd also got the potency and we didn't need to put a covalent warhead on it. Understood. Which meant that we've ended up in a presenting a different chemical series with the prospect of going to the clinic, which will have a different ADMET profile, so both ADME and TOX, and 
probably a different resistance profile. So we were we were staying aware of what was going on, but I I slightly liken to it like being in a swimming race, in that you mainly focus on the end goal. You don't look too much at the people next to you because the goal is to get to the end. And fundamentally, it doesn't actually matter if there are multiple treatments for COVID-19 available. That's not a bad thing. Um, so in that sense, being a little bit different was part of our uniqueness. Does that answer your question, Mona Lisa? I've, I've talked a lot. No, no, you have, I am, uh, you have given me three more questions to ask, but I would be careful of time. So I think before we uh, get on with a lot of more questions are coming to me, I would request, uh, I think one most important thing is we would love to know where the program is right now. Uh, are there lead series that are being progressed? And uh, I think uh, they, as we understand, they are oral um, agents uh, to be taken, uh, you know, outside hospital setting. So that would be nice to know where the program, uh, program is now. Maybe we can flick on two slides um, to just give a, we can skip this one. And um, just to kind of give a um, visual um, picture of where we are right now. Um, so um, we, we basically have lead candidates that we have selected. Um, they have oral exposure, so we're hoping to develop them into um, orally available compounds. Um, we um, haven't whittled down our lead candidates to the final candidate that we are going to take through the to the regulatory phase because we're waiting um, for some PK data to do that. Um, we basically um, declared these kind of three optimized leads um, that we've selected okay. to, to characterize further in February 22. Uh, <coughs> sorry. And then over the next couple of months, we will um, settle on one final candidate. We are also very, very grateful to the Wellcome Trust who started funding us um, to deliver a phase one ready molecule um, in June 2023. Um, and DNDI, who's one of the kind of many collaborators of the Moonshot, is um, has taken on this grant. So this is the Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative. And um, what the aim of the grant is to um, deliver an oral and safe antiviral and, and also the compound that is required to actually run the phase one. Um, and we are aiming to do that um, to ensure rapid and equitable access worldwide. Um, we do have accelerated timelines. However, they're not quite as accelerated as, for example, Pfizer was able to do it. Um, but um, within the kind of financial budget and within the um, kind of development budget that we have, we have accelerated the timelines as much as possible. Um, and this um, Welcome Trust grant funds the COVID moonshot for kind of funded us for the late lead stages of lead optimization um, mm -hmm. and will fund us all the way through um, to CTA at which point we'll then have to look for follow-up funding. So that's that's where we're currently working on. So we are looking at these free compounds and characterizing them further um, to then settle on one final compound. We have um, so on the left hand side, you can see like we have dropped quite a lot of series on the way. So there were there was mm -hmm. a lot of um, and maybe Ed can go further into this. So we had five lead series initially, then dropped two, had then three lead series, um, which we kind of try to um, progress at the same time. And then um, finally settled on the isoquinolones as the kind of series that we were concentrating on um, for lead optimization. But there is a lot of um, a lot of material that could be worked on. Yeah. We're, 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 so, so, go ahead, go ahead. Mona Lisa. So, uh, so <laughs> this is the, I'm still thinking of your last response, pardon me, and what uh, Annette you have added on. So it seems like we have a lot in our basket, right? If, if you really think about it, you have three or a couple of uh, antivirals that are approved. We have some new agents coming up. They're in clinical phases, but maybe my understanding I don't know if it's correct or not, so you have to correct it. All the MPRO inhibitors that are there today are interrogating the uh, substrate binding site. So do you think we have enough information about resistance emergence, ha. you know, uh, cross-resistance, 
And another thing which you would probably, even more difficult to answer that would be viral rebound post uh, treatment completion. Where are we? And do we really have enough or it's just the start of you know, a classical journey where this is the first generation. When we learn more, we get the next generation and the third generation, your views on. So, Aneta, you do rebound and I'll do resistance. How's that? I'll do it. I'll drop you. I'll, I'll drop you in it. But you can you can deal with the, the <laughs> clinical question, and I'll, and I'll just talk about structures. Go go ahead, Ed. Okay. In, in that case, can, can we go on? I think two slides, and we've got one that talks about resistance. So, the devil is in the detail, as as it often is. Um, so here we've we've done a little bit of work, looking at what so. You're right, Mona Lisa, we're all targeting the, the active site of the, the main protease, but that active site has multiple subsites within it. And what this shows, so this is just a, basically a contact analysis of where does it look like the different inhibitors are contacting different residues. Mm -hmm. And the, the resistance question is, um, the really easy answer is, resistance is what you get that you see in the clinic. Everything other than that is speculation. Yeah. But we can speculate. So if you just do the contact analysis, and this was done by one of our collaborators, you can see that um, nimetrelvir and the Shinogi compound and one of our lead series as demonstrated, they actually, because they bind into different subsites, they mm -hmm. contact different residues. Now, the process of resistance could require the mutation of both the enzyme and its substrate. So it's a non-trivial thing to because the, the virus still has to be viable in terms of yeah. reproduction. So where resistance emerges is a very complicated thing to predict. But what we can say is because we're making different contacts, you'll probably see a different resistance profile from different agents if they are not I mean if they're all binding and making exactly the same contacts you'd expect the same resistance pattern maybe yeah. but when you're binding to different subsites I think there's a good at this stage scientific argument that we would yeah. expect a different resistance profile which means having multiple agents gives you the prospect of cocktail dosing of rotating people yeah. through different agents when resistance comes up. It it just gives us more tools in the, the bag to go hitting the virus with. That, I think that was the easy question rather than rebound, which is why I took it. <laughs> um, I think just to add to that, um, the other, other thing that um, Ed just alluded to, um, potential cocktails, we kind of, we, we know from HCV and HIV that um, we'll get a faster development of resistance with single therapy. I mean, it's a very, very different picture because there we're treating a chronic virus for long, for long periods of time. But also in influenza, we do know that even with very short treatments, we can get resistance developing. Even with a one times treatment like baloxavir, you can get resistance development. So um, I don't think we are out of the woods yet with what, what we may get with a five day treatment and, and resistance development. But what we do know very clearly that even with very long periods of treatment, if we combine different mechanisms or different targets or um, and different drugs and, and, and potentially even different compounds targeting the same active site, we will have a lower likelihood of resistance developing. That's what experience tells us. We haven't tried it for, for SARS-CoV-2 yet. But um, I think there might be a good chance that if we have more drugs available um, and, and, and we will get a better feeling for what resistance will mean and what um, clinically viable variants will be. And then also which combination therapies we may have to um, use to get to overcome circulating resistant variants. And that will be a question that will, where we can build up preclinical data to inform clinical decisions, but ultimately we'll have to see what is circulating 
in different patient cohorts and what we can use clinically so that we can suppress virus. And, and, and we're very much at the beginning of kind of building up data and getting an idea of what, what these therapies and combinations can be. I mean, currently we're still looking at efficacy of single compounds in phase three trials. We haven't even looked at potential combination therapies. The other thing is that all the different compounds were developed by different um, companies at the moment. So um, that will kind of be interesting to see how combination therapies might come along. Come um, and then, then the other thing that um, you just alluded to, Mona Lisa, which was, was my part of the question was, um, the um, viral rebound that we're kind of starting to um, see um, with um, especially Paxlovid, we haven't got any data on the Shinogi compound yet, where we initially suppress virus um, with treatment and then can see a kind of virus coming up. And from the data that um, Pfizer has disclosed, um, that doesn't seem to be directly linked to resistance. It could okay. also theoretically be linked to viral reservoirs that are not completely accessible to the drug. Yep. And however, we simply just don't have enough data to answer these questions yet. So there are, there are several outstanding things that um, will almost certainly be addressed in um, kind of preclinical and clinical research over the next couple of months. One is treatment length. One is Look, establishing what viral reservoirs might be and how we can address those. Like one of the kind of obvious questions is, are there places in the body where the drug doesn't get to, where the virus is actually replicating and we can we get a clinical suppression for the duration of, of giving the drug. And then once we remove the drug, we'll get replication again and this might not be a mutated virus we haven't yet assessed to a great extent of whether re um, resistance development might play a role in this we've got some preliminary data that suggests that it may not be the driving factor but um there will be more will be more research done on that and then the the other thing that um might play a role there is um have we are we dosing high enough? Are we putting yeah, enough absolutely. compound in? And, and, and that, that is a question that is very, very difficult to answer because um, Nematrivir is actually the very first compound out there together with um, remdesivir and monopiravir where we can assess this. Um, and we, we're at the very, very start of the journey. We're literally at the moment in the um, observation phase where we are kind of looking at the data trying to make sense of it but we, we haven't got any kind of causal um, linkage yet so um, these the next couple of months are going to be very very interesting in answering especially the rebound question but also the resistance question and how they may be linked or may not be linked. As a biologist, I'm so tempted to continue this discussion, and this would be a webinar by itself, right? <laughs> but I think for the interest of time and our promise that we made to our uh, 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 colleagues who have joined in, we will try and take some questions at the end. I'll ask three very quick questions on execution. These are purely looking back execution questions. Uh, what do you think are the key strengths that made this possible? This is not an easy task for you as a group of uh, teams you have achieved. So three key strengths that made it. Um, so so let's, uh, let, I think we've, we've got a couple of slides. So a lot of this is actually about logistics. And, and okay. I, I, certainly I, I was guilty at various stages of um, ranting at the rest of the team that um, amateurs talk about tactics and professionals talk about logistics. So if we if we go on to, there's a slide that has got three circles on it. Yeah, this one. So some of it's about the data and obviously we're, we're in a CDD sponsored webinar. So we, we, we throw the bouquet to CDD for really supporting us in being able to move our data around professionally and get it all in one place. And it's kind of vital um, we're not talking about a um, a cottage industry amount of data here. We have literally got thousands of data points 
from the compounds we made. And we've got the compounds properly registered. We've got proper calculations done on them. We've done real life admet studies and it's all lined up so you can prioritize your compounds for test. And being able to move through from design. So we had a <clears throat> design system that allowed everybody to see all the compounds that people were thinking about, get them into synthesis. We did automated docking, we did automated FEP calculations, working with our colleagues at Enamine in a very rapid way, understanding when the compounds were made, getting them shipped. You, we've already talked about the multiple places and then getting the data back. You just have to do it professionally and be quite focused about it. Um, and that's, I, there was a mixture of some very good basic data infrastructure and practice and a lot of hard work from people making sure it stayed working, doing the slightly unsexy job of making sure all the data's loaded, making sure the compounds are in the right place at the right time in the right amount. Um, and and I, would like, I would like to point out here that we actually, um, we massively relied on the existing compound logistics that were established at Enamine. Yeah. Um, we couldn't have done it without a logistics center and, and none of the other partners that were either academic or distributed all over the world um, had this in place. And, and, and we actually really felt the hit of the, um, of, uh, of the um, events this year in February, when Enamine suddenly had to shut down the logistics center in Kiev. Um, yeah. and, and we had to kind of move our logistics, which luckily was at the end of lead optimization, because if it had come at any other time, it would have completely corroborated the project. So, um, um, but, but it just shows that without a functioning logistics department, which we were able to use through Enamine, and this project wouldn't have moved anywhere. Um, because um, if you want to ship different concentrations of compounds to 10 different groups worldwide that are going to run antiviral assays on different um, IC50 or different dilution curves, um, and you don't have a liquid handling department that can prepare the plates for you, you're stuffed like and and that's that's what enamine has done all the way through they logged up all our compounds and they actually have them on the catalog so anyone can order them yeah. so this is and and this was this was one of the unique things so whenever we wanted to ship compounds we didn't need an mta we didn't need to kind of say oh yeah we need to kind of um, get the legal agreements in place we literally just said go onto the enamine catalog and get this and this and this and this compound. And then our collaborators were able to run their tests on it. So that was that was probably something that is quite unique because it was an open access project. Um, but it was also very much dependent on their logistics center. So Nick, I'm going to ask two curiosity questions here. One of them is you mentioned data, but we all know in real life data came in all forms, right? Excel sheets, different readouts, different formats. Very difficult to harmonize. How um, it, it was not easy to you know then bring them in a format that then allows you meaningful decision making. So if we, the first question is if you could elaborate a little bit on how you dealt with that challenge. Second question is about very interestingly you had told me you also have handshake agreements. Forget about contracts and so and and even with big pharma. So what was your relationship and how did how, what were their contributions to an open discovery program? Uh, so, so for the, for the kind of big pharma question, I can pick that one up because I work very closely with both. Um, so, our um, two main contributors on the big pharma side were Novartis and Takeda, and um, um, and and for both of them, um, we we kind of uh, actually there are loads of others, but this is for the logistics and, and data processing question specifically because we have loads and loads and loads of other. And big pharma contributors on the medicinal chemistry part that Ed was more involved in. So I was, I'm now talking about the kind of ADME PK antiviral testing site. Um, and, and there, um, it literally worked as you just um, suggested, like because um, 
um, our compounds are available on the enamine catalogue, um, we basically just told them the compounds we are interested in and instructed enamine. So we got the comp compound synthesized at our cost and then um, basically asked enamine to send them out um, following a kind of um, discussion between enamine and Novartis or Takeda independently. And then it was it was literally a handshake agreement. Novartis said, yes, we're going to um, we're going to measure these assays for you. They asked enamine to send out the compounds and we paid for the shipment to Novartis and Novartis um, measured these assays in kind for us and sent us the data back. And we were then responsible for uploading the data into our database formats. So it was um, done without signing a single agreement, um, all these um, in-kind contributions, which is quite unique, I think. It, it is, I think that the thing we'd add to it is there's a, um, it's an open science collaboration. So everybody could see the structures and the data. You know, the, it, so if you were the, if you were contributing in kind, you could see the structures, you could see the data you generated. That's a fair exchange of, of kind of information. Um, for the, I'll, I'll just pick up on the point uh, Annette made about medicinal and computational chemistry input. We had very straightforward discussions with people about what they were prepared to share. For some of our contributors, we have excellent long-running contribution by, from colleagues at UCB who provided superb level of computation and medicinal chemistry input. And we'd had discussions with their, they discussed with their management team about how much time people were prepared to contribute pro bono. And again, they had a, access to the data to use as they saw fit. Um, so it's, some of it's just about maintaining very good open honest communication with your collaborators you explain to them what you're doing no surprises you show people show each other data it's a non-for-profit endeavor directed everybody understands the rules of engagement from the start so people who want to and are able to contribute do and people who don't or are unable to don't it's not in that sense, it's if you get the communication right at the start, it works um, to the level of which we now have compounds in preclinical development. That's a measure of working. You have to admit, at Ed, though, that there was always a level of surprise when we said, when, when, when basically this discussion started getting in onto the legal level and we said, no, we actually don't need that you can literally buy the compounds off the catalogue or we can send them to you for no cost. Um, so there was always an element of surprise and um, actually pleasant surprise in some cases that we actually didn't need a legal agreement. And I think we weren't able to move just as fast as other, um, other endeavors on, on some levels, but this was certainly a great time acceleration that we never had to wait for a single contract to be signed. Yeah, and if, if we could just skip on actually two slides, I think, there's a view of really, uh, this one is the one I, I particularly like. So <clears throat> we have gathered, everything you would have expect to gather in terms of a, a fully fledged full fat discovery lead opt program. discovery program you know we, we've got all the admet data you would expect somebody to have in going forward and just th this is really acknowledging <clears throat> that huge amount of antiviral testing contribution that we've had from uh, our collaborator and the only thing i'll build on from Annette's comment of course because we've been open for the academic groups, postdocs, PhD students, they can publish the work they've done immediately. There's no delay in saying, well, we've had some moonshot compounds, this is what they look like. That's okay. Um, so it's, there are benefits, there have been benefits all around. Um, it is complicated though. So listening to you, what makes me wonder, so if you look at uh, pandemic preparedness, uh, the under, it's, it's a bit, of, as, as we all know, it's a bit like disaster preparedness. Uh, you want to make things, you never want to use them. Uh, and I don't know in classical, in the classical financial model, is there a return of investment that is calculated today? 
So do you feel that uh, open discovery has a unique spot in an area like pandemic preparedness? And stretching it a bit further, is it possible to kind of disrupt the way drug discovery happens in today's world, pharmaceutical discovery uh, with open discovery? It's a very philosophical, second part is a little philosophical, but just would love to, your views on it. Okay, let's talk about pandemic preparedness. Right, I think the penultimate slide is is the one we need to go to. So, so we, we need to make a bit of a disclosure here. Um, so, slide before last, please, Charlie, if you can get us to uh, that one. And uh, no, beyond that, I need the the one with and beyond that, it's all going great. Yeah, let's keep going. That one. I oh, know, not that one. This one. Sorry, that one. The one you showed before right at the end that one so yeah. disclosure so having worked on the, the covid moonshot the nih has chosen to fund uh future pandemic preparedness and essentially the moonshot team with some some more collaborators so we built the team larger you can see there's a, a huge range of superb people have got involved in this so we are involved in a pandemic preparedness project to look at future Perfect. coronaviridae uh filoviridae and the last one that I can't pronounce. Lavi Viride and Picana Viride. Th thank you very much. This is why it's a collaboration. Um, <laughs> so, so we're doing this and we think we can be more open than the classical model. Whether we will achieve exactly the same degree of openness as the moonshot, which was radically open, we don't know yet. We're developing that strategy. And yeah. what what the circumstances are for being able to bluntly put on the shelf treatments for diseases that don't exist yet is quite challenging from a kind of intellectual property business development perspective. So it's a difficult problem. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it and we can start doing it before all of that's completed. Now, do I think that open drug discovery has a place? in the overall landscape of drug discovery? Yes, I do. The COVID moonshot was a particular problem at a particular time with a particular set of data. Now, I do think there will probably be other places when that will be equally valid. Do I think it's going to radically change and revolutionize the whole of drug discovery? No, I don't, um, but I think it will be a um a scenario that can be played out and we've demonstrated you can do it so it might be a case say in some orphan diseases you might be interested in it you might be interested in it. pandemic preparedness may be a place where we can do this uh we're certainly hoping to make a huge amount of data openly available um whether yeah. we can do it completely is is a live question i mean we're still working it out at the moment yeah. Like it's, it, we are still at the point where we're trying to bring a lead candidate into the clinic. We haven't done it for the COVID moonshot. We've been able to run up to now um, as an open science project. The other, um, Ed, the other part that may be um, interesting for this kind of discussion is AMR as mm -hmm. a kind of field. Absolutely. Um, yes. where, where open science certainly um, will could could have a big impact and um, so and also has a big has had a big impact already so I, I think um, it, it, the concept as such is not new the workability and the kind of translation um, will require a lot of thinking and a lot of um, experiments on a kind of not not experimental level but on a kind of more um, drug access and drug accessibility level um, so that's that is something that um, I think we in collaboration with with DNDI um, are very very interested in to see how that how that can be implemented. But I, th I think I'll make one last build because we should leave at least a moment or two for questions um, is that there is a fundamental reality that research has to be paid for and that we we have spent a lot of money in, well, in, in normal human terms, we've spent quite a lot of money. Actually, the moonshot was really cheap and efficient in terms of if you looked at a biotech spending only this much 
to get molecules this good would consider itself to have had a really good run a really tight project but it still has to be paid for and so if you want open science that requires you know governmental or not-for-profit or philanthropic invest spending it's not investment because you're not getting your money back you know let, let's be really clear you're going to pay to get drugs that can go straight to generics in an open set and if you want to do that it's quite straightforward you pay for it and what the nih has done in creating the the end this the avid centers is say we are going to pay for you to discover discover new drugs and so you can do it because of, and what's probably changed from 20 years ago is there is such a rich cro ecosystem is that it's very possible you know, we've just demonstrated that you can discover drugs without having your own lab to do all of it you don't have to be a big siloed farmer you can outsource a huge amount and you can move compounds and data and do the job you can be a little virtual farmer which is what essentially what we became do the job you just need to be able to exchange money for data which is what happens if you can do that it's possible so bluntly if you want it you fund it <laughs> Um, so uh, we have three minutes, and I really want to make sure that we take a couple of questions. Uh, we have it on our screens. I don't know, Edanet, are you able to see the questions? Yes. Um, okay. I haven't actually read through them. Yeah, neither me. So we are going to try to do it very quickly. And if... Um, so I think they, one of them... One of them we already kind of went um, went through a little bit is the second last question about AMR and neglected disease, um, and and I, I do think um, I don't I don't think the COVID moonshot was only um, able to work due to pandemic fear. I think that was that was um, kind of fueling the mag the major buy in. Um, that we had into this kind of project, but I think on a kind of more long term um, research and development and discovery um, um, within that landscape, um, other diseases, neglected diseases, AMR, um, rare disease would be other areas where, where this approach is very, um, would, sh should be very viable. Um, and, and I think this um, AVID Center for Pandemic Preparedness is, is, is one first step, but um, I would envisage that um, for other disease areas, um, a similar approach could be taken as well. I'll pick up the last question, actually. Yeah. The, uh, what, what plans are there for manufacturing and distribution? That's a, literally, we have that in, going on at the moment. So the the broad plan is engaging with generics companies, which we are doing. So there are live discussions ongoing with those to be able to step through from the process research and development, which is going on at the moment. So we're doing scale up synthesis and we have a plan in place for being able to then move to scale up for manufacture. All of that is ongoing. We believe we can do that. The distribution would be as generic medicines. So um, there's probably almost as much work going on right now in building the path forward as has already gone on. So the, as anyone who's worked in R&D knows, the R part is tiny on a log scale compared to what you have to do in development. But you have to go through each step at a time. So it's, it's being built. Um, and I, th and I think it's doable, actually, from what we where we are at the moment. So um, for, for Norman's question, which is the one just above, um, why not focus on other targets that are not MPRO, which is the target um, for clinically used drugs? Um, so, yeah, that is that is part of what we're um, planning to do um, as part of this um, new AVID Centre. Um, we want to also kind of look at other targets that are not yet clinically validated and generate um, chemical probes 
early data that can enable later on pro um, programs. We won't be able to push all these through up to IND because that's th that would exceed the funding that's available. But um, the the very very much the aim is to bring two new compounds through to IND um, and actually enable a lot of other um, less um, explored targets and, and see whether we can um, generate probes, whether we can generate assays, which will then be openly available for other groups to pick up as well. Thank you, Annette. Uh, Unfortunately, we have just run out of time. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to both of you, learn about your experience and your perspective. Uh, we could take some questions. Apologies for everyone questions we didn't answer, please reach out to them directly. <laughs> I'm volunteering. But thank you so much. And thank you, CDD team, for uh, giving this opportunity. Over to you, Jelly. Yeah, you. thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, most definitely, thank you, Annette and Ed and Mona Lisa, for participating in our webinar today. A very quick reminder, uh, a small piece here of the COVID Moonshot puzzle was the use of CDD Vault. Um, our platform is a collaborative system allowing users to register and collaborate around small molecules, biological entities, and assay test results. There are tools for inventory management, data visualization, and an electronic laboratory notebook for tracking and sharing all of your experiments. So please see our website at collaborativedrug.com for more information and for a personal tour. Reach out to us at info at collaborativedrug.com. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing everyone again and best of luck to the COVID moonshot and your continued success. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Mona Lisa. Bye. Bye. Bye.